Hey everyone, this is Mike Cashew and you're listening to the Brute Shrink Podcast. This week I interviewed Amy Everett of Catalyst Athletics. Amy has an incredibly inspiring story of going through extreme hardship uh, as a child to becoming one of America's best lifters to now being one of two female international weightlifting coaches. Uh, so we talk about coaching, leadership, uh, body image, and in general, we just have a ton of fun. Amy is an absolute blast, and she's got a lot of wisdom to share. So before we get started, if you've been a regular listener of this show and haven't done so yet, please put this show on pause, head to iTunes, and leave me a quick review. Hope you enjoy the show. What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew. You're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. Amy, thank you so much for giving up some of your time today. Um, this is long overdue. Uh, you are, you're someone that I look up to so much in the community, but also someone that I consider a dear friend. And you're one of the most entertaining people I've, I've ever met, as well as one of the best coaches. So I'm very excited for this conversation. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. And oh my gosh, thank you for all those nice words. So you're, you're actually one of the most authentic people I've ever met. You're unapologetically yourself at all times, as far as I can see. Have you always been that way? And if not, what changed? I actually haven't always been that way. I think for a long time, I had a lot of insecurities and you know, you go through these different things as a woman, I'm sure men go through, everybody goes through it where you're just kind of trying to find yourself. And I found myself always trying to fit into what other people were doing or, you know, Oh, you like pepperoni and anchovies on your pizza. I love that when really I thought it was the worst thing in the world. And one day I, you know, I don't know, maybe about 12 years ago, I just woke up and I was like, I, this is exhausting. I am so sick and tired of not just being myself. And I basically just decided one day that I was going to be who I wanted to be. I was going to be the person that I loved, you know, and I just figured people are either going to love me or they're going to hate me but I'm not going to pretend anymore so that people like me. And I just decided, you know, perhaps if I love myself so fiercely, when others see me, they're going to know exactly how they should love me. And that's right. when I made that decision. And I just, I am always very honest. And some people may think I'm, you know, brutal or harsh, but I just don't sugarcoat things. And I'm an honest person. And I, and stay true to my values and who I am. And if people don't like that, they can fuck off. <laughs> That's what I was looking for, which, which, <laughs> which brings me to my next topic. What, what's uh tell everybody about your, I think it's a coloring book. Would you call it a coloring book? Oh, yeah. yeah. I actually did that one day. I got the new iPad and it come, you know, it has an iPad pencil and you can doodle on it. And it's like the coolest thing ever. And I would just sit on the couch and I would, doodle these curse words like everything I was feeling about a particular <laughs> person you know like because I generally I, I generally uh or generally <laughs> hate a lot of people and it's not that I hate people I just get so irritated so I would get irritated with something I saw on social media and I would be like oh what a twat waffle and so I would like color it out and doodle it and then it just became like so soothing because I didn't <laughs> yes. think I didn't want to think negative things about people and be a total bitch. And so I was like, wow, if I just, you know, I draw this and it's really soothing and healing. And then it just kind of I kept doing doodle after doodle. And I, I realized like, wow, well, if this is so good for me to draw this, maybe people would like to color it. And so. Um, I we compiled it into a little coloring book and decided to sell it. People love it. It's it is been, hilarious, been and the introduction to it is just <laughs> so well written. I absolutely loved it. So yeah, if you find oh, yourself you. if you're listening to this and you and you uh, want to get out some angst and you want to try your hand at coloring some uh, some twat waffles and and different things like that, <laughs> uh, Adi sure has loved it. Yeah, you can find it on Amazon. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, um, 
And especially, it's especially good for people who don't like to cuss. Like I, I say the F word more than I say normal words pretty right. much. It's, it's a really bad habit. And so for people who don't like to cuss, I think it, I've gotten messages from people who are like, well, I can't say those words. So it's been really nice to actually like color those, the words I'm <laughs> <laughs> to be able to have some association with those words that I really want to say but never can. Yeah, exactly. That's great. That's probably why you and I get along so well because that's that's up there in my my uh, most frequently used words as well. Oh, for sure. So before we get into weightlifting, would you mind talking a little bit about your history, your 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 upbringing, and kind of set the backdrop for what led to a, a very successful weightlifting career? Um, do you want to know my life story personally or like yes. how I met Coach Bergner? <laughs> yes, personal story. Um, so, well, I like to say that I was raised by wolves. This is another thing that I, I'm going to backtrack for a minute. This, My past is actually another thing that led me to not giving a fuck anymore about what people think of me because when I was a child all through until I graduated from high school I always used to pretend that I was somebody I wasn't because I was so afraid that people would judge me because my parents were heroin addicts and um you know my one of my parents were always in and out of prison and it was just a really rough situation and I used to lie people would be like god Amy like you play all these sports why do your parents never come to any of your games or your meets and I would be like oh my dad's traveling on business you know I would make all these excuses and lie because I was already like a shunned kid I didn't you know especially when I was younger before I could get a job I would wear the same thing every day to school I would you know, not have clean clothes. We lived in a trailer um, probably for about five years of my elementary school up into up until eighth grade. Um, we lived in a trailer without water or electricity. And wow. so it showed when I went to school and people already made fun of me and didn't like me. And it, you know, it, it really was a hard way to grow up and identify as a person for who you really were because you when you're making excuses and lying all the time you, it's hard to know who you are and I think that was an exhausting and hurtful and damaging way to live and so that you know kind of helped me lead to finally be like okay well this is who I am and it's easier now definitely as an adult to talk about the fact that I did grow up with heroin addicts and um, I had a very, very rough upbringing. And, you know, like I, I said, my parents were in and out of prison. My dad had a meth lab. Um, you know, SWAT teams would come to our house. I saw my mom OD at least four times. Um, there were situations where my dad had a gun to my mom's head. I mean, really just crazy stuff. And looking back, it's, you know, I think, wow, God, my life was like a, one of those movies you see with drug cartels, but, but except we were the poor drug addicts. We didn't even have, <laughs> right. Like I did, you know, we were eating butter because we were starving me and my brothers and sisters. So that is my upbringing. And, through high school, I think that, you know, every every survivor of a family life like that, of abuse and pain and darkness, they, they really make a choice. And you can either choose to be a survivor or you can choose to be like your parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do have siblings and not all of us made the choice that I made. And fortunately, I was a good student and I got really good grades and I used school as my escape so that I didn't have to go home. And that's when I started playing sports in high school. I remember as a freshman, I was this skinny kid. I must have weighed 90 pounds. I was malnourished. I was a skinny kid and I joined basketball simply so that I could stay at school for three more hours every day. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, I started playing sports and I got better and better. And I found that I was pretty naturally athletic, thankfully. Nobody in my entire family, not just my immediate family, but my entire family are athletes. And I just use that as an athlete. I mean, I use being an athlete as a sort of strength. You know, I, if I, it gave me a purpose. I think it started as an escape and then it, it became something that gave me purpose. Like, okay, I can feel strong. However, in high school, we had a weight room, but it's, it wasn't like it is today where, you know, conditioning and training and lifting weights and, and becoming strong was so, you know, prevalent like it is in schools today. It wasn't a thing that I never stepped into a weight room. Um, I was playing volleyball and oh, the, the day I was playing volleyball and I decided to go to college to pursue volleyball and the day after I graduated, I packed up my little car and I moved about two hours away from home. My aunt was very generous and let me come stay with her um, for a couple months until I kind of got on my feet and, and was able to move to college. And I didn't even tell my parents I was leaving. I was just out. And I joined a club volleyball team over the summer until I could go to college in Long Beach. And my volleyball coach, his name was Mike Abruzzo, he was like, wow, you know, you, you really have a great vertical jump. You're such a skinny little kid. And, you know, we need to get some weight on you and some muscle on you. And he actually sent me to Mike Bergner. Wow. It's about 23 years ago. And he, Mike Bergner at that time, he, I mean, obviously long before CrossFit, he was a strength coach at a, at a high school, but he also trained a lot of beach volleyball players, professional beach volleyball, uh, volleyball players like Karch Karai and Gabrielle Reese and Liz Masakai and these very successful volleyball players. So he also worked with, you know, high school volleyball players and stuff. And that's how Mike Abruzzo you know, knew him. And so I walked up his hill one day, like a scared kid. And I was 18 years old. And I walked up and everyone's training in his garage. And I was just, I had no freaking clue. I had never heard of Olympic weightlifting. I had never seen a barbell. i had never lifted a barbell. And he had, he just got me started. And he basically, <laughs> back then, there wasn't all these fancy progressions. And and ways to teach. He basically said, do you see what that guy's doing? I want you to do that. Right. And he, he put a, a training barbell, a light barbell in my hand and said, okay, do what that guy's doing. And I started and I loved it. And two months later I qualified for junior nationals and it was, wow. I just, yeah. You know, I, I think for the first time in my life, I felt like I belonged somewhere and it just, it was incredibly, uh, I'm still incredibly grateful for him for I I always tell everybody that the life that I have today is because I met Mike Bergner. He changed my life. I mean, he stepped in as a father figure. He walked me down the aisle. He, you know, introduced me to my husband. He I started cross, you know, getting involved in the CrossFit since day one because he was in it. So I've been able to be around this community forever and just really grow as a person and an athlete. So that's my life story. And it's <laughs> amazing. Amazing. It's, uh, it's one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard for sure. Do you think that you felt like you fit in because of the, uh, the people that were in the community and coach Bergener, uh, or because you were so good at the sport or a combination of the two? I think I definitely felt a sense of family um, you know, I had had coaches in high school, but none of them like him who actually cared and he treated me like a daughter and was in, invested in my future. And, and yes, of course, the fact that I was, I, it came very naturally to me was exciting. And, but I didn't know at the time back then, I didn't know that it came naturally to me. I didn't know that I was naturally gifted at the sport or that I could snatch so well. Like I didn't get it. I just did what I was told. 
now as older as a coach, I do get it. I do know that I was very gifted because I, I see, you know, coaching in CrossFit gyms and, and the way that Olympic lifting is now. And I, I teach it to so many people. I see there are people that are very not naturally gifted at the sport and it takes a lot of work. And, um, so I am, I am very grateful and I wish that then I would have known that I was gifted and I wouldn't have been a shithead right. after I do so many things to coach Bergner that I just regret because I was a shithead. Um, and then, you know, it was a sense of family. I was part of a team and I, you know, made great friends. My uh, Most of my bestest friends today are all because I either met them in that garage or because I met them through lifting. And that is such an amazing thing. Adi was telling me something funny this morning. She said that early on in your training, Coach B had to literally drink whiskey while you would tra- while you would train <laughs> because you were so emotional. Can you that talk about true. kind of how you were as a as a young athlete in there, like just yeah. getting into so, it? And actually, he started drinking Jack Daniels when I got competitive. <laughs> Not, I mean, I was competitive in the beginning, but when I got to that elite level and I was actually competitive in that I was trying to make world teams and, um, you know, I was top in the country. That's when he started drinking Jack Daniels. And it's because I, I am a very emotional person. Anybody who knows me, I don't hide, hide my emotions. Like, and that goes back to my brutal honesty, but it's also because I love so fiercely. And so if it's something that I'm focused on doing, like my fight club today or weightlifting or coaching or my friends, I love with everything I have. And with weightlifting at that time, you know, I loved the sport with everything I had. And when the sport fights back and when you can't, you know, on days you can't do anything and or when you're fearing your competition or all of the up and down emotions that come with being an elite athlete, I was emotional and I would cry and I would cuss. And also I, like I told you, I was a shithead. I was young. I was dumb. And he did start drinking Jack Daniels. And I think he, it would, he, I think, it, you know, he loved Jack Daniels anyway. And so he <laughs> used it as an excuse. Right. He would come and sit in the garage. He would make his Jack and Coke and he would come and sit on his chair in front of my platform. And that's where he would coach with his Jack and Coke. And there were days that there was definitely way more Jack than Coke. And it, it would be so strong that I would be bending down to pick up my, to, to get set up for my snatch. And I would get a whiff of it. (laughs) Make me dizzy. Um, yeah, and he still he still talks about that. He'll be like, I drink Jack and Coke because of you. And I'm like, I have not been competing in a long time, so what is your excuse now? And That's then he's hilarious. Like, well, I, I still have to put up with you, you know. Um, but yes, I was a very emotional I was a very passionate lifter and I was very um I had a lot of tenacity. Mm-hmm. And I still have that now, even though I don't compete, every time I go into the gym well, maybe not every time. Okay, that's a bold faced lie because there are, there are are days that I go in there and I just don't care. I'm just like, oh, eff it. I don't I don't care what I do today. But I um I am very tenacious. And Jessica's been living with us for two months and she'll be here through Pan Am well, really through worlds. But since she's been in the gym with us every day, I feel like I have to set an example. And so my tenacity and feistiness has definitely come back. Um, and more than that, I try really hard to make all my lifts look perfect. Whereas before when Jessica wasn't here, sometimes I would just go in to get through the workout. Um, you know, but now she, she watches me and she looks up to me. And so I need to make sure my movement is as good as possible because she watches that. And on days that I don't think my movement's going to be very good, then I do an exercise, you know, I'll squat or do strength work um, so that she doesn't have to see that. And 
also right now, I mean, I'm not lifting to compete anymore, but I really, I think that I'm lifting because I want to be stronger in fight club. So that's why I lift. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a different, it's a different passion. I mean, I think Jessica said the other day, I think you're going to be snatching until you're like 95 and that's probably true. Just, and your numbers are still better than most girls. Um, I don't know, most twenty year olds, most twenty five <laughs> year olds, most thirty year olds. I don't put all of my train all my training numbers on Instagram. Like I, I really feel like training like a ninja is, you know, always important. You know, you never want anybody to know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. But <laughs> even if I'm not competing, I still have that level of secrecy. But yeah, I am. I am really happy with where my lifts are at my age and my training level. I'm not on a program. I just, I mean, I write my own program, but I kind of, it's more like a, Oh, today I feel like doing this kind of thing. And so I am very happy with where my strength levels are right now, especially considering I've dropped an entire weight class. So I'm happy about that. So cool. So yeah. you're, you're the only female level five weightlifting coach in this country, correct? Um, actually there it's a, it's an in, USA weightlifting international coach and there's two of us. So Ursula oh, was the okay. first. Yeah. And she's actually the president of USAW right now. Um, she was the first and she is a senior international coach because she has gotten more than one athlete to world championships Gotcha. and I'm just an international coach, but I'm only, so I'm one of two female international weightlifting coaches this country's ever had that is awesome i think i think now that you I say it really I, I what's that it's really exciting and to come in behind ursula who is just you know she was such a an amazing person for our sport and getting it to the olympics and everything she's always she's just amazing um to come in behind her makes me very proud mm-hmm I think now that you're saying this, I, I I talked to Coach Camargo and he said they did a did away with the quote unquote level five, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now it's basically there's a club coach, um, something a national coach, an international coach, and a senior international coach. Mm -hmm. So those are those are the different um, levels. Um, when you were coaching a D, I remember her saying from time to time that she went harder. She, she pushed herself harder in the gym with you than she had ever done in her training in her life because she wanted to make you proud. Um, and she said that you kind of pulled that out of everyone. What do you think that, uh, what do you think that is about? Like, why do you think you elicit that kind of response? Is and is it something conscious or, or unconscious? It's definitely something unconscious. I don't like do something intentionally to try to make them do that. Um, I do think that most, I would, I would say most athletes perform better when they have a coach and someone, you know, telling them what to do every day and, um, writing their programs. But, you know, to, I think to be a good coach, really takes more than just writing a program or being present in the gym. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure why my athletes do that. I mean, past athletes have done that as well. Um, it's not only with the D and Jessica, but other athletes I've had, whether it's in CrossFit or Olympic weightlifting, they've always <laughs> latched onto that sense of like, I'm going to fight harder because Amy's watching me. And I, I think that definitely makes me proud. I, I, but I don't have an answer. I don't know why they do it. I think that it's because I coach my coaching style. Um, I coach with my whole soul. I put every part of me into coaching. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not just what I do behind the scenes, but it's what I do with my athlete, whether you know, I'm trying to teach them tenacity or teach them to be tough or the mental training that I do with them um, or the pure fact that my athletes feel loved. Maybe that's why they want to work harder for me because they know how much I invest into them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. 
And so I think if I were not the kind of coach that I am, um, then I probably wouldn't get that response because I think that you have to put into your athlete what you want them to put into you, into their training. And I want my athletes to always be the best version of themselves. And I just told Jessica this yesterday that, that sometimes it's not about the numbers that you're lifting or, or the way you're lifting, but it's your attitude about what you're lifting that day. And I want them to go into the gym every day and give me the best version of themselves that day. Not, not the best versions of themselves ever, like at their best competition, but what they have to give that day based on their emotional state, their fatigue and any pain they're having. Um, maybe they have diarrhea. Maybe their cat just died. Maybe they're, they caught their boyfriend. <laughs> cheating <laughs> like, Love it. Whatever the case mm-hmm. that's affecting them that day, I want them to, to have the attitude to where they give me the best they have to give under the circumstances they have that day. And if they can do that, then that's all that's, that makes me proud. It's when they let the fact that they're, you know, they have diarrhea or whatever, and it gives them, it makes them have a shitty attitude and they're feeling sorry for themselves and pouting and like Debbie Downer that I hate that shit. It's like, okay, you know what? You choose to be an athlete. So if you have diarrhea, you go shit your brains out between your sets and you do what you can do. You know, like that's (laughs) so harsh me, but that's, you know, what I expect of them. And I think because I invest that into them, like I said, I invest those feelings into them that they want to make me proud. And I mean, it's a process. I have to teach them this. It's not like they walk in and they're like, "Woo, I'm going to do this. Now there are days where I'm not a complete asshole and I can really see that they, you know, maybe need to take an emotional day or we have to back off a little bit. But for the most part, I want them to be the best versions of themselves in the most tenacious way possible. Yeah. I think uh, two, two things that really stand out. One, they trust you as much or more than anyone else in their lives because they know how much you care and you, and you show them how much you care through your actions, being present, giving them your attention uh, and investing like you say you do. And then the other is that I think we all love to be held to a high standard. Um, you know, we want to, all of us want to grow. We want to be challenged and you hold these, these guys and girls to such a high standard that they know they're going to get better training under you because you're not, you're not going to accept anything but their best. And everyone, everyone wants to do their best and to have that level of accountability. Um, it just feels, it, it feels amazing. Yeah, I, I really do think so. And that is something that I definitely learned from coach Bergner and also another coach that I had Bob Morris is that not everybody that walks into your gym is going to be a world champion. Maybe they'll never even qualify for nationals, but whatever their goal is or whatever level they're capable at, they better be fighting their ass off to be, to be there, you know? And it's like if someone comes, if I'm coaching someone and you just know they're never, ever going to make it to nationals, it's just never going to happen. It's not in the cards. And they know that, but they just want to be like the best local meat lifter they can be. Then that's, I'm not going to like put some high expectations on them like and coach them like they're trying to make a world team. I'm going to coach them like they're going to be the best fucking local meat lifter in the world and because that's what they want and that's what they're capable of so i would hope that that's the energy they put forth does so that what, make sense well what's the difference in your coaching style for those two types of athletes i think that um i think my coaching style is this is the same with everybody i coach meaning i still put forth the same amount of effort and attention um, in that I'm putting forth the effort towards their level. So 
Meaning Jessica, for example, I coach her very differently. And real quick, just for those who don't know who she's talking about, this is uh, Jessica. Jessica Lucero, the best 58, 58, right? Best 58 our country's ever had. Yeah, but yes. that's 58 kilo lifter that America's ever had. So I coach her very differently than I coach maybe one of my online clients who just wants to lift for fun. Because if I put the kind of pressure on those lifters that just want to lift for fun that I do with Jessica, they're going to quit. They're, it's not going to be fun for them mm -hmm. because they're not an elite level athlete. They're not trying to make the team, you know, the Olympic team. And so they don't, they don't need to be pushed that way. They more need to a cheerleader. Like that was amazing. You know, that's kind of what they need because they're just doing it for fun in their garage or maybe they have three kids and it's their outlet. And so I think I pick, I mean, I think I, I adapt to, also I adapt to what each athlete needs. Jessica may need something very different than a D who may need very, something very different than one of my athletes named Amy or are very different than Lindsay. They all have different emotional needs physical needs. Um, you know, some people need to be yelled at more. Some people need that need that to be fired up. Some people need me to tell, you know, it, you have to, to be a good coach. I think that you really need to know that one thing doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to invest in your athletes, you need to invest in who they are in and outside of the gym and what they need to be successful. And you need to do that. If Jessica needed me to dress up as a purple unicorn during her competition, because that's what motivated her, then I would dress up as a purple unicorn. I believe that. I believe that. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, it, and coaching, it doesn't start and end when the athlete walks in the gym. I think you have to be a life coach and you have to be a therapist and so many other factors go into making you a good coach. And I learned that from coach Bergner and Bob. I mean, coach Bergner really taught me that coaching from the soul is not something that is taught. That is something that is in you or it's not. And you have to learn what your coaching style is and and you have to be the best version of yourself so that you can be the best for your athlete. That's my opinion. How do you balance investing so much of yourself into these athletes while also protecting your own time and, and like the other areas of your life? Like do you have to set boundaries or how do you go about that? Oh, there are no boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Greg and I were actually just talking about this recently because, uh, coach Bergner warned me a long time ago that to be a coach, if you're a good coach and you invest in your athletes, you're going to get your heart broken a hundred times over because athletes leave or they get married or they get knocked up or they quit or whatever. And you just get your heart broken. And I think that I don't know there. I don't think there is a real good answer. I think that I make myself available to my athletes 24 hours a day. They know that they can call me or text me anytime they need me. Um, I don't, I don't really draw a whole lot of boundaries um, unless it comes to my kid, you know, mm -hmm. to Jade. Like, hey, they know that if Jade has an event, like a track meet, she's in track season right now, that I'm not going to be available to them during that because my kid has to come first, um, you know, and, and myself, I, I have to come first because if I'm not taking care of myself and I'm not in a good place, then I'm not going to be any good to anybody else. And so I really have learned that I put myself first, my needs first. And if I feel like I need a couple days off, I'll just tell 
my athletes, hey, like, you're going to be fine on these three days. Here's your workouts. Here's what I expect. But you don't need to text me. Like, I'm just going to take these couple days where I'm not going to be around my phone. Right. Um, and I do that if I feel like I need a minute. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Because if I'm starting to go crazy or if I'm having something going on in my own life, um, I never would want it to trickle towards my athletes. I would never want it to affect my job or what I'm doing or how I'm coaching. Um, and so I always make sure I take care of myself and my needs first and then them. So I guess that that's the boundary I set. But other than that, there are no real boundaries in that they know I'm available to them when they need me. Right. Well, it's it's interesting because you and, you and Greg have built – in in my opinion, the the largest weightlifting education center in the world, uh, with your website and the magazine and everything, and you could easily be coaching thousands of athletes, e coaching thousands of athletes all over the place. But instead, you choose to only work with a handful, and you go very deep into these into these uh, you know into these few coaching relationships. Why, why do y'all choose to do that versus? work with, you know, a ton of other people? Uh, for me, I think that I, I mean, I have thought about doing like a workout of the day type of, you know, Amy's programming type of membership thing, but I haven't really gotten to, I haven't developed something that I feel comfortable with that would, I don't want to, I want to make sure I'm not doing a disservice to anybody. Mm -hmm. Um, in that, in coaching the masses, you just, we have to learn to say no. And Greg does, there's a ton of workouts on our site, a ton of programs, um, for all different levels and situations. And I think that that's the way we kind of offer our programming to people because, right now, we want to, right now, in the time in our life, we want to focus on other things rather than having a massive team of 50 people or, you know, a hundred online clients. For example, my daughter's in high school and I want to be able to be a mom and, you know, take her and pick her up from school and have her friends over and, and be very present in these last couple years before she goes to college. I have the rest of my life mm-hmm. to be a coach. I mean, but I only have, three and a half years left with her before she goes off to college and she wants to go to New York. And so it's going to be kind of far. And so I think both of us want to be present in her high school life. And if we're coaching a bunch of people that takes time away from that, it, you know, it, you have to, it's just more work. And with Greg, he's working on a bunch of projects and he, You know, when we moved to Oregon and we closed our gym, we did that because we wanted to simplify things a little bit and to not have a gym and coach a bunch of people because Greg does want to work on projects and we do want to be present in our daughter's life for high school. And we are, we want to have quality over quantity and getting Jessica to the Olympics is a lot of work. And so because of that, I mean, I do have a couple other athletes, but I'm not willing to wear myself so thin that my athletes aren't getting the attention that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And Greg is, he, he writes like 13 different programs right now, um, for competitive athletes, not to mention all the other stuff he does and all the other programs he's doing and the workouts of the day and the programs he's creating for these sites and, and things, and he wants to, I, I mean, I can't speak for him, but he's writing a book, and he he wants to continue to put out good material and be a good resource for people all over the world, and when we had the gym, we found that something always suffers if, you, if you're being pulled in so many different directions. Right. And for him right now, he wants to focus on his few, you know, the athletes that he has. And I mean, we've been here since June. And when we were coming here, we're like, okay, we're going to build this junior team and we're going to start recruiting. And, 
you know, we're going to have people build this big team here. And then once we got here, we're like, you know, that's just not what we want right now. And maybe that's something we want. We'll want in the future. We really want wanted to build a gym here like Coach Bruner's where there's a sense of community and we have a team coming, but we're just not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. We're not quite ready. You know, we've owned a gym for a million years. And so I think we're kind of liking the quiet and liking focusing on on our on the athletes that we do have and and we're not really interested right now in, in doing a bunch of recruiting and you know and starting a developmental program and stuff like that. Right. I love it. It's um I think it takes a lot of discipline to be able to say no to some of these things because all of those different opportunities that you that you have coming your way you could you could make more money you could you know have more notoriety but you're very clear about what you want in life right now and what you value and you're and you both have the discipline to say no to these things that's very admirable yeah. oh thank you i mean it is hard i mean i get emails all the time and i'm just i want to take everybody i'm like oh great we should take this person oh greg we should take this person oh what about this person <laughs> right now we're just like okay we need to like take a step back and um, really focus on continuing to build our brand and to continue to be a great, like you said, um, you think that we're the biggest um, Olympic weightlifting resource. And that takes a lot of work to, to be able to do that and to continue to bring content and, um, and stuff. And so, like I said, yeah, that's our focus right now. And I don't want to, we have athletes, you know, the athletes that we have, we don't want to take away from them by just adding a bunch of other people, you know, just right. for the sake of some money. Like right. it does, it's just not fair. And I don't want to be doing anyone a disservice. If I'm going to take on another athlete, I want to know that I have the time to be able to commit to them and to invest in them to what they need. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're a coach. Athletes take a lot of work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, okay. So you've made a pretty serious transformation over the past couple of years. Um, what what caused you in the first place to reach out for help with your nutrition? Um, I think, well, a couple of things, really. A D had come to us to, to form a partnership to work with Catalyst Athletics. And I didn't know who she was. I was I was like, I'm not willing to put our name on the line for her. I don't know who she is. I mean, she'll tell anybody. Like, I decl we dec I declined her a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I said, I don't know who she is. Why, why are we going to, you know, work with somebody? We know nothing about her. We know nothing about what she does. Um, are we willing to put our reputation on the line for this? And... She had started working with one of our athletes at the time who since has, has not, she's not lifting anymore, who was really having time cutting weight. But I didn't know how compliant she was. I didn't really know what was going on. So I, I basically told the D, okay, if you can work with me, and I'm a crazy person, let, I want you to work with me so I can learn about this. I can see what it is, uh, what, you know, working against gravity does, what the lifestyle is about. Um, because I wanted to be educated on it for myself and also so that I could talk to clients about it or I could, you know, have answers for people who contacted me. And at the time, so, you know, I had spent so much time weighing 69 kilos because I was a 69 kilo lifter. Although I, when I was training at a high level, I always was around 67. I don't think I ever competed at more than 67. Um, but when I stopped training so hard, my weight shot up to like 70 or 71. And it was just so much extra weight on my frame. I'm naturally a smaller person. And so I said, I told a D, okay, you know, I'm not competing anymore. I don't need to be a 69. And so I'd like to get back to my normal non-competitive body weight, which is around 60, you know, between 63 and 65 kilos. And so I said, you know, let's do this. And then we'll, we'll, you know, basically to, I wanted to learn and be educated for Catalyst, but also wanted to see what it would do for me. Cause I had always just been paleo. I'm allergic to gluten. I'm celiac. And so I already don't have 
gluten in my life. But I, so I was very paleo, but I didn't have a lot of self-control. I'd be like, Oh, almond butter is paleo. And I'd sit down and eat like an entire carton. Uh, yep. Um, and so I started working with the D and then, you know, she started coaching me and, um, I started coaching her and it was a love affair. And so I love it. I, you know, and, and the working against gravity, not only has it changed many of my athletes lives, um, so many lives around the world, but it really changed my life. And I have bad anxiety and having that control every day, um, with my food and knowing that I'm giving my body everything it needs to be strong and healthy. It, that, that level of control I have every day really helps my anxiety. Being, so yeah, having control over that one area of your life allows you a little more like that's one less thing you have to worry about. Right. Exactly. And it just, Exactly. Like I like being, I like the control I have over my food, like weighing it out and measuring it and know that I'm eating correctly. And of course, like I love the transformation my body has and we've done it slow. I'm not in a hurry. I mean, I've been with WAG for two years mm -hmm. and, but I'm the strongest and healthiest and fittest I've been ever. I'm not the strongest. Let's not go that far. <laughs> I'm the strongest 40 year old I've ever been. Yeah. I feel better than I felt in a long, long time since I was like 20. Mm -hmm. I feel great. How has that changed your uh, internal dialogue? Uh, you mean regarding like my self image and stuff? Yes, exactly. I think that, I mean, all, all my life I've battled with self image. Um, I hate to be one of those people to blame everything on my childhood, but it definitely stems from my childhood when I was that like ugly, ratty, dirty girl. Sure. And I was always self-conscious of what I look like. And, you know, going into my teen years, every teen worries about what they look like. And I was always very little. Uh, when I was an athlete, a, a weightlifter, like at the higher level, I never really worried about what my body looked like because I knew it was performing right you know I was treating so hard that I looked fine I look good anyway um good in my you know good in my standards I, I look fine and I'm not gonna say I was the fittest most beautiful hottest person out there and with CrossFit and Instagram these days I mean these perfect beautiful bodies are shoved in your face every day and it can be very depressing but I didn't worry about my looks as much then because all I could think about my body was that it was, it was enabling me to perform. It was giving me the tools that I needed to be to train and be the strongest I could be. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I stopped competing and my body started to change and shift that I became very self-conscious. And I never wanted to be in a bathing suit. I mean, people would come over to my house to hot tub you know, like Chelsea and China Cho and all of these people, Jolie and these people that have these beautiful bodies. And I'm just like, Oh God, like I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to go in the hot tub because my stomach was puffy and I, I didn't even have an ab, let alone six or eight of them. Um, and I was soft everywhere and I just had like a layer of flubber all over, <laughs> all over my muscles. And, uh, it, it like instead of having like these nice great quads, it started to look like someone pulled poured oatmeal in my tights. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> so damn. Oh, that's great. And uh, yeah, so definitely, I have my confidence back because I don't have that extra layer. And of course, I still compare myself to everyone. I mean, I tell a D all the time, like, okay, I. Now I admit that I'm 40. For the last 10 years, I've lied and said I'm 30. So now everybody in the world who listens to this is going to know I'm really 40. But now I'm actually proud to be 40 because I can look at myself and be like, oh my God, I'm 40. Whereas before, I'd be like, I'm just 30. And <laughs> and now I'm like, wow, I'm 40 and I have this body. And I'm, I try really hard to be proud of my body. And yes, it is a battle sometimes, 
you know, and I don't, I don't like comparing myself to other people. Um, I think it's natural to do so, but I'm much more secure now knowing that my body is what I have. Mm -hmm. It's what was given to me. Um, genetically, none of my other family members were athletes. So maybe that's why I got screwed with the six pack thing. Uh, but, um, I think that being on WAG and, and having a D as a friend and a mentor has taught me to love my body for what it is mm -hmm. and for what it can be through my eating and through my exercise exercise and I know how healthy I am and I feel how strong I am and I think that that gives me all the confidence I need to look in the mirror and be proud of how hard I've worked to be where I am especially if I look at my before pictures when I look at those I'm like I was just lazy I just basically ate and prayed it didn't go to my stomach mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have really come a long way in that body image where I'm not worried about being in a bikini anymore. And I'm okay when I wear shorts because I'm not self-conscious of my legs. And I actually wore a crop top last week for the first time since I was like 22. Go ahead. I know. So pretty much I just strut around <laughs> and I'm the hot shit. I'm the hottest 40 year old on earth oh, except JLo. Yeah. Is that totally conceited? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> I think it's um I think it's amazing that you feel that confident about your body that you that you can dress exactly how you want. Um and there's no Yeah, if, if some people don't like it then then screw them, yeah. right? And I'm not going to lie and say I don't have insecurity still because there are days that I do. There are definitely days where I wake up and I'm like, woo, my body's banging today. And then there's days that I wake up and I want to wear a potato sack. <laughs> and I think that's just something that females go through, especially with social media. It's awful for, you know. But I, But the most important thing that I've learned is that I respect myself. I respect my body. I'm grateful for my body. I'm grateful that it's healthy and that I'm not skinny. Like I like being curvy and I like having muscles and I like having a little bit of oatmeal in my pants because it's, it's normal. I, when I put tights on, if there's not a little bit of dimples, then I feel like, like I, I don't, I don't want to look like I've been Photoshopped. I want to look normal and not, well, there is no version of normal. That's the wrong word, and I apologize. I want to look like the average woman, but healthy, the average strong, healthy woman. Right. I want to look like me. I want to look like the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. That was so up and down. That Those sentences just now were like a complete roller coaster. They should be nicked out. I got this. it. Everybody that listens to this is going to get it. What do you, what do yeah. you think uh, – what are, what are some of the most useful – either tools or, or um, tactics that you use when you're feeling that way about your body or you, you find yourself comparing yourself to others and, and get yourself into a negative headspace? What's, what's been the most useful way to get yourself out of that, to snap out of it? Um, a couple of things. One, I look at my before and after pictures. And, you know, my, from my very week one to the most recent, and I remind myself, look how far you've come. Mm-hmm. You are the best version of yourself. You can't be the best version of somebody else because they're not you. That's what their body looks like is outside of your control. And I remind myself, like, I'm the best version of Amy. And that's all that matters. If I'm, if I feel the strongest, if I feel the best, if I'm happy and if I feel healthy and I'm walking around with a smile on my face every day and I feel, I mean, I look around and I'm so blessed and happy that I'm the best version of myself. What more can you ask for? And so when I, when I see that or when I'm comparing myself to others, I try to remind myself of that. Like, I can't look like her. I can't look like that person because that's not me. You know, I don't have abs like that. I don't have hips like that. 
Like, this is my body, and that's her body. And she looks amazing good for her, but and I look amazing good for me. That's what I remind myself of, and that really helps. I love that. I have a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Okay. The fir- and these are, well, the first one's fun. So it, it's, uh, it's called the three feelings question. If you could have one of these three feelings at all times for the rest of your life, which would you choose? So the first one is the feeling that you get. It's been like a long day. You've been working like in the yard, doing manual labor, just really working your ass off. Maybe you trained once or twice um, and you're just absolutely exhausted and you've been looking forward to like being able to lay down all day and you finally, you showered and then you just lay down in bed. Right. That's the first feeling. The second one is you've gone all day and you've been like so busy that you haven't gotten a chance to eat literally anything and you're starving, you're cranky, um, you know, your your stomach is just completely empty and you get to the restaurant and they have your absolute favorite food in the world and they prepared it just the way you like it. And that first bite that you you take that first bite of that food that you love, that's the second feeling. And the third feeling is that is the feeling where you you've been driving for hours and you say, let's let's pee at the next at the next stop. But it doesn't come for another 30, 45 minutes and you have to pee worse than you've ever had to pee in your life. And then you finally get to go and pee and that feeling of relief. Which of those three feelings would you choose to have for the rest of your life? (laughs) God, those are all really three great feelings. I'm going to go with the first one, with getting in bed. And the reason I'm going to do do that is because last night um, I, I got into bed with my iPad to finish my new Netflix series I just binge watched. I went to Greg who was reading a book and I said, getting in your bed at the end of the day is the best feeling ever. So that's what I'm going to go with. Hell yeah. I'll tell you mine. I, (laughs) and I'm honestly, I'm the only one that I've ever heard choose it. Mine is after you, after having gone pee because I, I love the other two feelings so much but the lying down one, it means that I'm about to go to sleep and I'm like very like exhausted. And so uh, I don't want to be, I don't want to be like going about my entire life, like in that low, that low energy state. And then the first bite of food for me, it's really exciting, but I'm still also like kind of anxious because I'm starving. Um, like I just yeah. want to, I want to eat the entire burger in one bite so that I can like fill that hole <laughs> inside of me. I agree with that. But then having gone pee, it, you're like totally relieved. You're totally present <laughs> exactly where you are. <laughs> and from that state, I feel like I could be very effective, uh, productive, and, and successful. So that yeah. that's mine. Yeah. Well, that's a good insight. But I'm a lazy per- person. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, and I love laying in my bed. Like – in the middle of the day, at night, right. whenever, I'm like, oh, bed, and I get yeah. out my book, and it's like the best thing ever. I guarantee you, if I was into that at all, a D would be all over it. But I, other than going to sleep and waking up, I don't like to spend literally any time in the bedroom. I don't know why. I've, I've always kind of been like that uh, that way. Um, oh, not, not you. Um, okay, lastly. What advice do you have for young women or, or men for that matter that deal with self-doubt issues, low self-esteem, et cetera, that want to become more confident? Wait, can you repeat that? I, I want to be really, I want to think about my answer. Yep. Can you repeat the, the question? Yep. What advice do you have for people that deal with self-doubt issues or low self-esteem, et cetera, that want to become more confident? Okay. I think... Um, I think it's important to find someone you look up to, um, to kind of help you through those, that self doubt, um, whether it's a training partner or a coach or a friend or Oprah, (laughs) like, 
I think it's important to find someone that is your vision of strength. Like you look at someone, maybe it's on Instagram or maybe it's a family friend or an athlete and you look at them and you, and you think, wow, they're so strong and they're so not strong, meaning like you can clean and jerk, you know, 200 kilos. I'm saying strong, like mentally and physically and someone that you just look up to and who inspires you and someone there in everybody's life. There has to be one person where you look at that person and say, because of them, I don't want to give up because of them. I'm inspired. And if you can have someone like that in your life, I think that that really helps self doubt because you can have a, a role model, a hero of sorts so that you can start building your insecurities up. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's someone you can talk to um, and reach out to um, to learn tools and exercises to become more secure in who you are. And I think that everybody has insecurities and everybody doubts themselves in and out of sport. And the way to conquer those fears is to keep doing. And what I mean by that is if you're insecure about something to, you have to face it and be like, okay, what am I insecure about? I'm insecure about the fact that like my body image thing, um, or your strength in the gym, maybe you feel insecure because you feel insignificant compared to everybody else in your gym. What can you do to make better? Like, what can you do to make yourself better? What right. can you do to be the, the best version of yourselves? Maybe you're not going to, you know, be rich froning, but maybe you can find tools to be the best version of yourself. Maybe you need to reach out and find a coach, or maybe you need to go to a support group, or maybe you need to Instagram message that person you look up to. You know, there's a hundred different ways to reach out for help when you are feeling those feelings of insecurity and, and know that you're not alone. You're not the only person in the world that has self doubt and insecurities. I mean, even, even Rich Froning probably has self doubt and insecurities. Like they're everybody. Absolutely. And it's how you deal with them that is going to make you a better person. That's actually been one of the most useful things for me dealing with my own insecurities is realizing uh, either either listening to podcasts or reading articles or even just talking to the people uh, myself, whether it be billionaire entrepreneurs or professional athletes or just people in every area of life that I look up to. They all have insecurities, and a lot of times they're they're on the of the same degree as mine. Maybe they're about something different, but they feel the same to all of us, right? They feel well, really uncomfortable sure. and painful, and uh, you know we just have to all accept them and and continue to work through them. And no insecurity is dumb. Like if you if you go up to someone and say, you know what, I'm really doubting myself. Um, about my snatches or about this competition or about the way I look in this dress for, you know, my first date. If you go to somebody and and say that and admit that you're feeling insecure and they look at you and say, that is so dumb. You should not feel insecure about that. Then that is not the person you need to be talking about because no insecurity is dumb. No insecurity is too small. No self doubt is insignificant. It all matters and how you deal with those or how you get beyond those. That's all that matters because you're working towards doing something right. You're working towards making a self doubt um, something you're not afraid of anymore. If you're doubting yourself, like you said, maybe listen to podcasts or or read some articles or reach out to to somebody else and, and find the tools you need so that those insecurities don't overwhelm you and drown you because it's a very scary place to be when you're, when you're smothered in self doubt and you're so insecure or you're constantly comparing yourself to somebody else. That's a very isolating, scary, damaging place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, like you don't want to be in that place. You don't want to live in that place. So how can you get out? 
I mean, I had like, I've had so many insecurities and self doubts over my life. And I've always either worked them out myself by writing lists, like, okay, why do I have these insecurities? Here's 10 reasons I have this insecurity. And here are five ways I wish I could be better. And here's five tools that I can do to start getting better. So for example, maybe my insecurity is my clean and jerk. Let's just say that because it's weightlifting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say my insecurity is clean and jerk. Like, Oh God, we're going, you know, my team is doing these clean and jerks and I'm always like the weakest. And I don't like clean and jerk in front of everybody because my technique is bad and I look like shit. Like, okay, well here, this is like, I think writing a list is helpful. Here are 10 or, you know, five to 10 reasons why this insecurity is an insecurity. Why do I feel doubt? you know, self doubt about this particular thing. And here are five things that I can do to make that better. So maybe, okay, my, my clean and jerk is my insecurity. So maybe I reach out to a training partner and ask if they would be willing to spend some extra time helping me. Or maybe I take a weightlifting course, or maybe I reach out to a weightlifting coach that I look up to that I know can maybe help me with these technique issues or, or get some private lessons. You know, does that make sense? Absolutely. And then then you're going to get more confident and it's not going to become an insecurity anymore. But if you don't do anything about those things that you're insecure about and you don't do anything to make a change, then you're just going to drown in them. Like for example, my body, I, I was insecure. I hated my body. I thought I would looked awful. And so I reached out and got help from a D. And on days that I am feeling insecure, I remember my list of reasons I shouldn't be insecure. For example, here's my before and after. Here is how hard I've worked. You know, I'm my own best version of myself. And then that kind of reminds me like, oh, wait, I don't need to be insecure about my body anymore because I'm banging. Right. (laughs) Right. 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 Yeah, that's so helpful. I mean, you're, you're talking about becoming more aware of your, your insecurities as well as creating a plan. And even if it's not yeah. a perfect plan right out of the gate, uh, you're at least trying things. And that's the only way that you can really figure anything out is try them, discard exactly. what doesn't work, and continue down a path of things that do work. You're making an effort to change so that you don't have self-doubt or those insecurities anymore. Right. What can I do to change so I don't feel insecure? And I think as long as you're actively trying to change, then you're trying to be the best version of yourself. If you don't do anything about it, then those insecurities will never go away. You know, and surrounding yourself by people who care about you and who support you and love you, those are all things that are going to help too. You know, like I hate to call a D out here and use her an example, but you know, she has started crossfitting and she's joining these classes and she's part of a community now. And, you know, I know that she gets insecure because she finishes last a lot. And I was like, you know what, who gives a shit where you finish? You're getting up every day. You're going to the class. You're a part of something. And every day you're going to get better and better. Right. Pretty soon you might be winning every workout. Like, You know, I, and it's not to discount her feelings of being insecure or, or to say you're, you know, you're so dumb for thinking that like who, what I'm saying is like the point that you're even going far outweighs the fact that you may not have a top finish in the class. Right. And then now she's started to take more pride in how hard she goes in the gym, right? The showing up every day and really like pushing herself harder than she's ever pushed herself before. Because she wants to be the best version of herself so that she doesn't feel insecure anymore that her crossfitting standards aren't that of Katrin's. Right. (laughs) You know, she's not Katrin, she's a D. Right. And so she, you know, and you just can't compare yourself to other people. You can look up to people and you can strive to be like them, but you can't come down on yourself and think you're an asshole loser because you don't, you're not just like them. Mm -hmm. 
And I think a lot of self-doubt and insecurities definitely are intensified because of social media, because so much stuff is in your face. And I do always give the advice too to my friends or people that I'm life coaching. Um, I give advice that, hey, if seeing so-and-so's Instagram makes you feel like shit and makes you feel down about yourself and every time you get off, you're like, oh, why can't I look like her? Or why can't I, you know, bench press like him? Or why can't I be as fast as her? Or whatever the case is, then don't follow that person anymore. Don't go look at their page. Don't seek them out. I know that's easier said than done, but you have to take some control. You know, Instagram, Facebook, those things are so damaging to people's in, it's just so damaging to your self-worth when you start comparing other people to you, mm-hmm. especially like in sport where you're like, Oh, I'm injured. I can't train right now. Why are they doing so well? Like, don't look at that shit. Like, why are you torturing yourself? That is just adding. I like to say that there's, you, you have a house. Okay. You build this great foundation with bricks and every day your, your foundation of self, you, You're the foundation, right? Every day you want to add a brick to that. Like, oh, I look so cute today. Or, you know, oh, that workout was so great. This is all adding to your self-worth. But if you look on on Instagram and you're like, oh, fuck, I'm such a loser. I didn't do the workout as good as that person. Why am I not like that person? Now you have self-doubt. Now you're taking a brick away. And your foundation is going to start crumbling. If you Mm -hmm. keep taking bricks away every day, because you're insecure and comparing yourself to other people, then you're ruining your own foundation. You, you're taking away from your own self-worth and you can't do that. I love that analogy. Awesome, Amy. Thank Thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, what else, what, where can people find more about you? Keep up with you on the social media, even well, as long as they don't compare themselves to you. (laughs) <laughs> Where can I keep up with you? Um, and I don't, not on Facebook. Facebook is only for family and close friends. But Instagram at Amy's Two Cents, A I M E E S, the number two, and C E N T S, Amy's Two Cents. Also, Instagram at Catalyst Athletics and CatalystAthletics.com is where you can find all my amazingness. Hell yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. This is phenomenal. You're so welcome. I'm sorry if my answers are all up, down, all around, and like word vomited. <laughs> They're amazing. They're I hope perfect. you get the point of what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. They will. Thank you. Okay. Just have- love your goddamn self, okay? Love it. All right. Have a great day. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Hey guys, if you have a question that you want answered related to health and fitness, mindset, business, et cetera, please don't hesitate to call in. Um, I absolutely love being able to connect with you guys and answer your questions or having friends of mine that are experts help me answer your questions. So if you're interested, call into the hotline at 801-449-0503. That's 801-449-0503.